Good evening, everybody. David Burns with you. Thanks for joining me on my live stream tonight. Good to have all of you. I see so many of you already are talking in the chat. You've got some good things, uh, good questions to ask. I want to welcome all of you. Say uh, a warm hello to all of you. And I hope our internet does well tonight. We are under a pretty uh, torrential rainstorm right now, and we have satellite internet. So Fingers crossed that we hold the ship together tonight. So if you see me kind of phase in and out, be patient. I'll probably phase back in. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But good to be with you all tonight. And uh, as promised, tonight we're going to be talking about mistakes that new beginners make. Not really new beginners, but I would say most people that are in their first, second, third, fourth, even fifth year, these are still common mistakes that beekeepers make even five years into it. So I'm going to be talking about that starting off tonight. Let me give a special shout out to Christian and Brian and Sherry for helping me administrate the live stream tonight. Always, always need help. Always a big help to have people behind the scenes helping out a lot. So that's much appreciated. Also, I have a Hives for Hero shirt on. And I wore this in a couple of videos back, and uh, some of you were asking me about Hides for Heroes. And this is a website. I got this shirt from their booth when I was down at Hive Life and um, paid for it because I really liked the looks of it and promoting those who uh, serve our country like that. So that's what this shirt is all about, if you're wondering about that. Also, I always want to thank all of you. I'll thank you in advance for when you click on the little dollar sign just below the chat and leave a donation, a super chat or a super sticker. And uh, always appreciate that so very, very much. And uh, you guys are great. So let's get into what I want to share with you tonight. I want to share about the common mistakes that beekeepers make within the first five years of beekeeping. I want to start by talking about how we wrestle with the gullibility factor. Now, a lot of new beginners, even people up to five years, they have a lot to figure out. I get that. And you're looking at every place possible. Like, where can I figure out how to do this and how to do that? And so you're going to be talking to maybe some people that you know that are into beekeeping. Or maybe you're talking to people at your local club. Or maybe you're here on YouTube trying to figure out, oh, my gosh, what do I do? I'm started, I've started beekeeping and I'm so confused. And so what can happen, and I want to put out a little yellow flag, not a red flag, but a yellow flag, is that we can be gullible and we can start believing everything that we hear, read, and watch. Thank you, Castle Highs, for that $10 donation. I really do appreciate that. But we can be so gullible at times that we start believing anything we hear, anything we read, anything we watch on YouTube. YouTube has really gotten a lot better. Those of you that have been with YouTube since the beginning, like I have, in the beginning, you know, it was like the Wild West. But now there is a lot more structure, a lot more credibility. The credentials are higher on a lot of YouTube channels. You're just going to have to use a lot of wisdom uh, to know what you're listening to, whether it's something that is solid or not. Thank you, Ray, for the $5 super sticker. Appreciate it, Ray. All right. So don't just be so gullible that you believe everything you hear on YouTube. And let's face it, I'm on YouTube, right? You're on YouTube now. And sometimes we can say things that, I mean, I may say things this year that I really believe are true and factual and I, I'm promoting it. Next year, I'm like, you know what? I've changed my mind on that. <laughs> uh, in recent recent studies, maybe I kind of don't believe that anymore, or I changed my mind. Science is always evolving. We're always improving. We're, new studies are coming out. If we're not flexible and begin to understand the, the science and what the uh, studies and experiments show, then we're not going to keep growing and beekeeping. So YouTube is a good place, but take it with a grain of salt. Same with clubs. Some clubs can be made up of top-notch people that are giving you sound advice, very good, helpful advice. Some can be made up of people that are just repeating things they heard that may be inaccurate or not the full story. Same with mentors. Sometimes you can have a mentor that is just rock solid, 
perfect. Sometimes you can have a mentor that learn from somebody and that information is not accurate. So you're going to have to, you know, take everything with a grain of salt and do your own kind of research so that you don't fall into being gullible and believing everything you have. Now, some of the mistakes that new beginners or one to five year old beekeepers, not really age, I didn't mean one to five year old, but been keeping bees with experience of one to five years, I think sometimes they struggle with, and I know I did, with they have little foundational knowledge. And I'm talking about in three categories. Listen to these three categories, bee biology, colony biology, and hive biology. Isn't that cool? I just kind of, you know, drummed up those three and I thought they really fit well into what I'm teaching tonight. Bee biology. That means what is the life of a honeybee? What do bees do at certain ages? How are their glands working? What do their glands do? How do they feed their young? You know, this is like a bee biology, four wings, you know, uh, they have five eyes, two compound eyes and three ocell eyes on top of their head. And just understanding that the bee has its own type of structure and what those structures do, you know, the they have the proboscis where they push that into flowers and suck up the nectar. Then it goes into a, a honey crop and then it's pushed out of the honey crop once they get back into the hive. But on the other hand, some of it is pulled with the proventriculus into the ventriculus and then gone into the mid gut and the rectum and all that. It's just good to know how bees work. It's real important. Charlie, I appreciate that $20 donation. Charlie, I see you leaving a lot of comments on my YouTube channel. I really appreciate that, buddy. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Way to go. That helps me so much when you guys leave these uh, donations like this. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that coming up, of what I'm using some of your donations for. That'd be great. Um, so here's some mistakes that uh, people make when they're one to five years of experience in beekeeping inspection mistakes they're not really sure what they be sh what they should be looking for how many of you have ever inspected a colony that went out there open up your hive and you really don't have a plan you really don't know what you're supposed to be looking for you're kind of like i'm just going to look and whatever i see i see that's not the best thing to do right you do what you wouldn't want your mechanic to do that you know if you you take your car in it's got a problem in the engine um, he needs to look at where that noise is coming from first before he starts tinkering around with your muffler or your bumper, right? <laughs> you, you need to know how to chase these things down. That's real important. So the first thing you do when you make your hive inspection is that you want to look for eggs. I think that's the most important thing. A lot of people want to find the queen. A lot of people say, I'm not feeling good until I know there's a queen there. Once I know there's a queen, I feel okay. I, I think Charlie, I think you made two donations there, buddy. So if that's, uh, yeah, you did. So thank you. Wow, another $20. Hope that wasn't like a uh, accidental thumb press or something. <laughs> I appreciate it nonetheless. But when you're looking for your queen, it's, it's just too much involved. Don't, don't take time to look for your queen yet on that inspection, right? What does the queen do? Two things. You're thinking like me, she lays eggs, everybody knows that, and she spreads queen mandibular pheromone around. She doesn't give orders, she's not the she's not the boss of the hive. She spreads pheromones and lays eggs. TJ, good to see you, uh, buddy. Good to see you there, $10 super sticker. TJ is a member of my B Team 6 mentoring program, and we talk on the phone quite a bit. I, I feel like TJ is a really good friend. We've spent a lot of time sharing our lives together, so on B Team 6. So thanks, TJ. So first look for eggs, because if you see eggs, guess what? You know the queen is there, right? You say, look, there's an egg. What does an egg look like? It's in the center of the brood cell standing straight up. That means it's just been laid. That's day one. Day two, it starts to tilt over like this. That means the queen was there two days ago. And when it starts to uh, it close into the, the larvae stage, it starts on the third day looking like a larvae, tiny little C shape on the bottom of the cell. So it, that's how you can kind of judge how your hive's doing based on the age of young larvae. You want to look for eggs. 
So if you see eggs, but you never see the queen, you don't have to see the queen, right? More than likely, those eggs are fertilized or in good shape. You got a queen. You want to look for problems when you're inspecting your hive. Problems are you don't see any eggs. You don't see any brood. Those are just the first red light signals of, uh-oh, I don't have any brood. I don't have any young brood. Maybe you have cat brood, but you don't see eggs and larvae. You need to panic and say, why don't I? Are there queen cells? Did I lose a queen? So if, my, if I don't see any eggs or young larvae, I need to start thinking about, do I have a queen in here? If I don't, do I have queen cells? Because if they have queen cells that are superseding her, I kind of don't want to buy a queen, right? Because they're already making a replacement queen. If I buy one, it may take two weeks to get here. By then, that queen's going to be out, probably mated. So I, I'm just going to kind of inspect around and see, do I have a queen? And if I don't, are they raising a queen? So as you can see, I'm leaning toward brood being the first and foremost thing that I'm concerned about, even before disease, is I want to make sure I've got good brood in there. And then I'm going to look for problems. Problems could be the queen. It could be brood. It also can be things like disease. American fowl brood. Do I have perforated holes in my capped over brood? Um, do I have European fowl brood where that is displayed symptoms such as the larvae on the bottom of the cells, they look transparent. You can see their breathing tubes or they're discolored or they start to stand up in the hive. They can darken in color, European fowl brood. They don't have such of a smell like American fowl brood does, but you can see it'd be spotty brood. There's some problems. Could be European fowl brood. We, we see European fowl brood more in the spring, by the way. So be looking for that. You need to look for any kind of problems like chalk brood. You need to look for sack brood. Sack brood is, a, is, is bad. So, you know, these things are, you need to familiarize yourself. If you haven't already, you need to take a look at uh, these images of diseases in the hives. The last thing that you should do during your inspection that you need to be uh, cognitive of is in, as a space. Do my bees have enough space to continue to grow I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but it's important that your colony has space. How, how about uh, feeding mistakes? Yeah, feeding incorrectly. And that is feeding uh, entrance feeders in the spring you can usually get by with because there's a lot of spring resources out there. Bees are less likely to rob a hive in the spring when there's other floral sources nearby. But you put that entrance feeder on late summer or fall, it will cause that colony to be robbed out. Why? All the bees, you know, that are looking around for stuff because there's a dearth maybe, they smell, they sense that feeder jar, that sugar water in that feeder jar, they're attracted to it from another hive. They go to the feeder jar, work their way there, and while they're there, they help themselves to the honey in that hive. They go back to their hive and say, I found a gold mine. The safe was left open. And they all go there and they rob out your hive. So never good to leave that entrance wide open with a feeder in late summer or fall. That should only be done in the spring. Quite honestly, I don't enjoy putting those on in the spring either because we have cold snaps and bees are less likely to go down and out of the hive on a cold night and eat that sugar water. I like to feed them from the top with my Burns feeding system and that's right above the cluster. So no matter what the temperature is, that cluster is going to be able to consume that sugar water even during these cold days of spring. Another mistake beekeepers make uh, is that they don't always feed their bees in the spring, fall, and winter. Thank you, Merlin the Wizard, $5. Hey, I appreciate that a lot. That's a very kind of you. Big shout out to Merlin. Really do appreciate you guys uh, donating to my live stream tonight. It, it really does help out tremendously. If nothing more, it just gets me excited and pumped up and <laughs> I appreciate it. So somebody may ask, are you telling me I should feed my bees all the time? Not when you have honey supers on because that, you know, want that honey, the honey that the bees are collecting to go in to your honey supers. You don't want it to be sugar water necessarily. So think about that. Think about, yeah, I need to Feed in the spring, like I just said, either you're starting a nucleus or you're starting a new package. It's cold outside. They can't get out and get stuff. Might even snow snow in the spring, right? 
and you want them to be built up, even if it's a, a hive that survived the winter, feeding them a little bit, getting them boosted up for, for the year is good before the flowers bloom. In the fall, I always like to feed in the fall because that's where I get my bees of dearth physiology. Used to be known as winter physiology until I single-handedly changed the name. <laughs> I'm trying to. Dearth uh, physiology. So that's a big thing is to feed bees in the fall. I think that's really important. Um, whether it's sugar, beet sugar, table sugar, cane sugar, I don't think it's ever made a difference for me. Get this, you know, a lot of us as humans, we live to be 70, 80, 90 years old. Wow, Texas, hands in the dirt. Thank you for that $50 donation. And uh, thank you for giving a shout out to Sherry. Glad you're going to be raising some queens from my beekeeping uh, queen rearing class. Scared to raise queens? Yeah, I was too. But hey, if you don't do it, you're going to fail. You're going to fail from not trying, right? So might as well try it. And if you fail, you're still better with experience and you can tune up your queen experience and get it to where you're not failing. That's really good. But as I was saying, um, you know, you feed them in the fall to get those bees of dearth physiology. That's what you want. You want these bees working for you all winter long. So feed in the fall to raise bees of winter physiology and then feed those bees of winter physiology during the winter time. David Galloway, $20 for the super sticker. Thanks, David. And I like that first name. We had good parents, didn't we? <laughs> you know, I've never been disappointed with my name, David. And uh, I've always liked it. I hear some people say they don't like their name, but uh, we have good names there. <laughs> hey, Eric, how are you? Let me move my... Uh, can I add uh, same plant base? I can't read uh, because my I'm using this slide right now, but base protein, pollen, I use for my bees and liquid. Uh, yeah, the if you use, um, I like to use the uh, protein powder, that substitute powder that's made for bees. I think that's important. So I like to use Ultra B, just got 80 pounds of it in today, big bags of it. But any, any bee company is going to sell you very good uh, bee pollen and you can use it in one-to-one -one sugar water. Uh, corn sugar, I'm not happy about corn sugar. You know, I, I just have too many other proven methods that I really like, and that's, uh, you know, cane sugar, just regular table sugar. Um, but I, I can't be definitive whether that's good or bad for bees. Okay, so feeding the bees in the wintertime, the winter be kind is what I really enjoy feeding my bees. That's what Ron said, winter be kind has done wonders for uh, me in the wintertime. Yeah, the winter be kind is just uh, a product that I created, designed, and invented the mixture and everything. So that's what I feed my bees all winter because look, those bees of winter physiology, they have the ability to do stuff like create royal jelly in the wintertime. If they don't have a lot of food in there, they won't create uh, royal jelly, and that makes the queen not wanting to lay and all. But if you feed them in the wintertime, you can dial that in and get a lot of brood production going on to keep that hive strong and warm in the wintertime, and it does do wonders. It's crazy. How about mite control? Another mistake new beekeepers make is they don't really practice. I mean, you got to be religious about this. You've got to just really get after mite control. It really is important. I don't think I've stressed that in the past on some of my YouTube videos, but man, I've been picking up the pace now because it, it's one, it does wonders when you really start to treat um, for mites. you got to treat for mites very strategically. Know that they're after your bees. Hey, Mark, good talking to you. Mark, Mark's another B Team 6 member that we chatted on the phone with the other night, and uh, he's got a lot of energy. I enjoy talking to him. Thanks for the $20 super sticker, Mark. Another good name, Mark. And I'll tell you why Mark is a good name. Because my only brother that I have is Mark. <laughs> Mark and David, you know. So uh, that's a good name, Mark. Thanks for thinking of us with that donation. So mite control, proper and consistent mite tests. I'm going to say you should test for mites at least every 30 days, somewhere around, you know, uh, mites reproduce in the generation of the bees. So the worker bees are 21 days, new bees are emerging. So about every 30 days is a good thing to just put on your calendar. 
And I want to tell you this about alcohol wash. They are the most accurate. Yeah, you can use Dawn soap. I understand that. And uh, but I really believe alcohol wash is a very accurate way to treat for mites. And the thing about alcohol wash is when I was doing the studies on it last summer, I made some videos for you guys. I found this and listen closely. Look, pay attention. If you do an alcohol wash, you slosh them around in that Saracel container and then you hold it up and you count the number of mites on the bottom, right? And you, you come to a conclusion like, oh, okay, I've got X number of mites. So therefore I'm at 2.5%, whatever. I don't think it's over. Wait a minute. I want you to do this. Count your mites on that first rinse, okay? Count them. Count the dead mites on the bottom. Keep your bees in the basket. Pull the basket out. Throw the alcohol and the mites away. Now, put it back together, and I want you to rinse it with water. There's no reason to rinse with alcohol again. Alcohol is only killing the bees quickly. So rinse with water. See if you can get more of the mites to fall off the bees. Because all those bees are clumped together. Those mites could still be like clumped in there. So I want you to rinse once with alcohol, count your mites, rinse again with water, same bees, rinse them again, count your mites, throw that out, and then rinse them a third time. You will be shocked. I was shocked and surprised how many mites I got when I rinsed them two more times after that first rinse. Wow, there you go. Some people say, Hey, I did a mite test, only got one mite. And eh, rinse them a couple more times, you may get more. Should you test every hive in the apiary, one out of five? Absolutely. In the doctor's office, when all the patients are sitting out there, the doctor would not go out there and say, I need to do a blood pressure check. So out of the 15 of you, I pick you. Everybody's going to have a different blood pressure. All your bees are going to have a different mite pressure. Now, you can sometimes get away with that, but likely... Some bees may have more than others, so it's better to test individually. How do you know which bees to take for the alcohol mite test? Should I be concerned about taking too many nurse bees? You know, that's a good question. Daniel would um, always take mites that are standing around wanting to jump in the open larvae. You see, they, they're, they're going to reproduce in your closed cells in the larvae. So you want to get those mites that are on the bees hanging around the brood nest area. So make sure you know where your queen is. Don't want to take her in the alcohol wash. Oh gosh. But uh, then you want to take bees from the uh, brood nest area, the open brood area. That's where you're going to have your greatest concentration of adult mites ready to jump in there. So that's a good question. Uh, should you rotate the type of mite control products that you use? Uh, to, so mites don't build immunity to the product. Most of us, uh, most of the literature, most of the people, the scientists say, yes, that that's a good thing to do. Uh, some of these things we believe mites can develop an immunity to, a resistance to, is a better word maybe. But uh, on the other hand, uh, some things it's going to be hard for them over time to build up some kind of resistance. But rotating different things is going to help a lot. Sure is. Um, so anyway, look at this. Oh, Mr. Approachable, five dollars. Do you have a video? Oh, I lost. Do you have a video about inspecting a dead ode to find out what happened and why they die? Inspecting a dead ode to find out what happened and why they died. If, if your bees died, I think the best way to find out why they died is to look back in your notes. You've got to look at the notes and say, when did I have a queen issue? When did I have some sort of a problem during the season? Did I have enough bees? What, what was the problem? It's hard to do forensic analysis on a pile of dead bees on the bottom. It really is. But if you look through your notes, you might say, aha, I never did recover from that queen issue. I never could get the hive built up, something like that. Uh, where do mites come from? How do they first infest a hive? Mites reproduce, they live, their home, their apartment is in cells in your beehives. They don't exist outside the hive. They are in the bees. They are on the bees. They're a parasite. They hang out on the bees. They reproduce in the sealed caps of the pupae, developing pupae. That's where they hang out. They do get on the, a forager, for example, and then the forager flies out, right? That happens. And we believe that 
mites don't intend to take a bus ride to a flower, <laughs> but they, they didn't know that's where the, the bee was going. And so on a flower, they can fall off or they may jump off on a flower and the bee fly away and leave them there. Another bee can land and they can get on that bee and go to a different hive. I don't think that's a really high uh, transfer rate out on flowers. I think more mites probably come into our bees and get on our bees when our bees rob out other hives. I think that's um, probably what's happening. Jeff, I am going to make a video on the extended release of uh, salic acid, but I'm not ready to make a comment on that <laughs> just yet. So let me say this, guys. You need to test, treat, and test. Some people ask this all the time. Every conference that I speak at, David, why don't I just treat my hives for mites? That way I don't have to test them. Because last year, a lot of us found that some of the treatments we were using, they weren't effective. We got a bad batch all across the country. It just wasn't working. And so if you didn't know that, you would treat thinking it worked, but since you didn't test, treat, and test, you didn't know it didn't work. Your, your, your mites were just as high. You went to bed at night thinking, I treated, I killed mites, I'm happy, but your bees are out there while you're sleeping, dying from viruses. So you need to test, treat, and test. So if you test, treat, and test, test before you apply your treatment and then treat them and then wait about 14 days after you're successful in stopping your treatment. Take a mite count. Let them clean out some of the dead ones. That'd be great. Uh, here's your first donation towards the Flow Hive. David, $10. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry, for all the Hive art posted on Facebook page. Love it. Yeah, David is like the winner of all things we ever put on, on the Internet. He's like, he, he, we had a giveaway on our Facebook. He won some stuff there. He, we, he'll probably win tonight. You know, pretty soon we're going to have to like a casino. Like if you have too many winners, if you win too much at a casino, I think that guys come out and kind of grab your arms and walk you out. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to start uh, sending some guards out to David and say, is this a lucky guy or does he know the algorithm or something? I'm just kidding with you, David. Congratulations. And thanks for the donation. Okay. So what about making the mistake of evaluating your queen? It's really good that you evaluate your queen and know if she's laying well. Um, listen, a lot of people want to hang on to a queen that's not laying well. Never a good idea. If your queen isn't laying well, you got to fire her. Just fire her, pinch her, get a new queen. You need brood. Brood needs to really cycle fast in the season. Don't put up with a failing queen. If you don't see good brood pattern, don't hope it gets better. Get rid of that queen. Replace the queen very quickly. And how about adding boxes? This is another mistake that it's common. One to five year experience beekeepers. They either add too many too soon and all the bees just make a chimney effect right up three or four boxes when they install a package. Don't do that. Or they add too little too late. They put them in a deep box, failed to add the other deep box after five to seven frames were drawn out. So the bees got congested in that single deep and swarmed. So you got to kind of time that out and make sure you get those boxes um, on the hive at a strategic time. It's going to help so much if you do that properly. So those are some things that I wanted to share with you guys about common mistakes that beekeepers make. And the first one that I started with, I think it's really key. You have to know bee biology, colony biology, and hive bi biology. Know that really well. Do I have to have two deeps? No. If you live in the deep south, a lot of beekeepers in the deep south run one single deep. But of course, you know, the bees are going to expand you're going to have to deal with the expansion of that by taking frames out, making splits all year long, or stacking a bunch of supers on so the bees can kind of keep their brood nests smaller and they keep putting more brood, uh, more honey above them. Um, but, you know, that's something that can be done. But e even in the south, you can still have a single deep that uh, if you're not careful, they're going to swarm. They're going to get crowded in there. And that's going to be a problem as well. So um, you be your own judge of that. Hey, Tony, I see a lot of your comments on, uh, on my YouTube channel. Thanks for the $20 donation, Tony. Really appreciate, appreciate that a lot. Tony is a good name. I don't have any relatives named Tony, 
but we'll let Tony uh, sneak in in the good name category. <laughs> Way to go, Tony. So as a lot of you know, I mentor about uh, 200 uh, people across the U.S., and I have for many years in my B Team 6 mentorship. A lot of you are here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and it's really fun. I've learned a tremendous amount of data from what new beginners go through when they ask me questions, because I realize, oh, this is what a new beginner doesn't know. This is the mistakes they're making. And quite honestly, it's really easy for me when I see people describing their struggles in their first year or two or three, because I realize what they don't have is they don't have a working knowledge of the fundamentals of beekeeping. And I, I think that's uh, very dangerous, actually. I think it's very dangerous. I've tried to answer questions, but I know whatever answer I give, it won't really be enough because I can tell they don't know enough. Is it okay to use only deeps for supers? If you have a strong back and you want to just really work out and lift that 80 to 90 pound deep as a honey super, go for it. I have, it's painful. <laughs> but yeah, you can certainly do that. It's not a problem at all. But like I said, if you don't have a fundamental in beekeeping, it's going to hurt you. Thank you, Richard. All right, $20 donation from Richard Ors. I appreciate that, Richard. Richard's coming in, wanting a good name. Richard is a solid name. I don't know if you go by Dick or not, but uh, Richard is a great name. And uh, thank you for making that donation. So we're going to offer some help to you guys if you don't have fundamental knowledge of beekeeping. Look at this. Starting this... Uh, in just two days, we're going to put our online courses at 50% off. And this is an introduction to spring sale. We know that spring is, what, the 20th or 21st of March. So we're going to just put our courses at 50% off as a way, because we know the common inflation today is tough. Everybody has to work hard for make a living. Prices are high. And it's a way of us helping people educate themselves on beekeeping and having that solid foundation so they understand when they start keeping bees, they have a good solid foundation. So make sure that you understand that um, these classes are going to be half price for a few days, right around the first part of spring here, just a couple of days. So have your finger ready on the mouse. Take advantage of 50% off. That's going to be hopefully helpful for a, a lot of you guys as well. So I appreciate that. Eric says, how many extra high bodies and super boxes and frames do you suggest in one year? You know, that's uh, hard to figure out. I think that would be great if, if we any of us knew the answer to that in advance like this. Um, usually I'm always desperate for more boxes. I've been building more boxes because every year I'm like, I need another deep. I need another super. Next week, I need another super. I need another deep. It's like crazy how how fast these hives will expand and run out of room. Um, generally speaking, like for me personally, all my all my hives are going to need two deeps. All of them will need two honey supers. All of them. So that's just a rule of thumb. Now I can only put one super on a, on a time, harvest it, put it back. I can get by with that. That's just a little more labor intense for me. So <laughs> yeah, I know you got to order some extra boxes. Hey, also... Whether you're, if you're a brand new beekeeper, have enough on hand that you can go get a swarm and put it in something too. That's important. So yeah, uh, High Flight 2X2, B Team 6 member. And I, I read your, I think I forgot the right email there in the night, the right handle. I believe you're a pilot. Yeah, you got to be with that, with that. And you were talking about that. So I appreciate that B Team 6 member. Have you mentioned, you've mentioned you'd like to requeen each year uh, when possible. How do you do that? Um, I usually wait until, I believe your name's Jeff, but I usually wait until about um, summer solstice around June 20th. Anytime after that, like the month of July or something, if I got a good strong population of bees, I can let them raise their own sometimes. That's going to take 30 days. That's a queen break in the brood cycle. They can also uh, cut down on the number of mites that I have because they reproduce in cap cells and I won't have those cap cells over that time period. But if you can't do without those bees for those 30 days, then you might want to buy a queen or raise your own and replace her sometime in late June or July. 
There's really some good benefits of that, by the way. You can actually have less swarming tendency because her pheromones are going to be really strong in the spring. That could cut down on swarm tendencies, help you control, control swarming. So I just either raise queens, put a queen cell in there, let her emerge in that queenless colony once I remove the old queen. Or if, I, if you were to purchase a queen, take your queen uh, cage, pull the cork or the plastic cup off, leave the candy in there and put it in there. After you pull the queen out, wait one day, 24 hours, let them know they're queenless, put the new queen in there, let them eat through the candy and you got a new queen going. How soon can I do my first inspection? A large colony all the way until February is now looking weak, worried I lost a queen. You know, you really shouldn't be pulling frames up, Lou, until you have temperatures around 60 or 65. You get by with it a little cooler if it's sunny and not windy. What we're worried about is capped over brood, the pupae, they're going to be exposed to cooler temperatures and they need to be incubated at 92 plus temperatures, 92, 95 degrees. If you pull that capped over brood out, it could really hurt them and not be good for them. So as soon as you can get in there and it's not terribly cold, yeah, take a look to kind of calm your nerves about your queen. Some businesses are advertising queens that are open mated. What does that mean and how do they ensure that? Oh, good question. Yeah, here's how that works. Open mated means naturally. Like you have a virgin queen. Maybe I raise a queen. I put her in a mating box. I let her fly out to a drone congregation area where drones are hanging out waiting for a virgin queen to show up to mate with. And, and she will mate with 20 to 80 drones in one mating flight. And all that sperm is stored in her spermatheca for her entire life. She can fertilize eggs until she dies, usually three or four years. Open mated means we just let nature do its course. The opposite of open mated might be II, instrumental insemination, or sometimes they call it AI. <laughs> yeah. And uh, A AI, artificial insemination, that's when uh, we actually um, extract the semen from drones and then we insert it into the queen in a laboratory. So she's instrumentally inseminated. And uh, there's a lot of talk about that, a lot of discussion. II has been done for a lot of years, and uh, you have a little more control over the selection of the sperm that you're using. If you open air mate, you know you're you're you don't know what you're getting. All the drones from a lot of congregations are hanging out. A lot of hives are hanging out in that drone congregation area. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I sometimes don't remember that all these things that are common to a lot of us that have done this for a while, like raise queens. Some of the terminology that I use, I don't realize that some people don't know what it's all about. What's the best way to store unused boxes and frames without, uh, with pre-waxed or even used drawn out comb? Are they subject to any issues during storage? Yeah, David, it depends on where you live. They can be subject to wax moths in August and September when it gets hotter and wax moths are everywhere. Ants can get in there if there's a little bit of honey. Small hay beetle can get in there. You know, if there's pollen or fermented pollen bee bread going on, you can attract a lot of stuff in there. Or it can just mold if it's in a wet climate, a wet room or something. Um, I like to freeze mine. I've got a lot in storage in freezers. That's a good way to kill everything that's on there. Um, in the wintertime, you can actually take it out there, turn a top cover upside down, stack them all up, put a top cover on top. And if it gets really cold, you can leave them out there all along. You can do that as well. Hey, uh, Grayson, do you suggest a drone flooding yard? I have tinkered with that. And what uh, Grayson is referring to is that when you're raising your own queens, then you want to put some drone hives, hives that are heavy in drone population using some green drone comb or something, and put them at, you know, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, or, you know, a mile or two away from your apiary and let let this area be flooded out there with more drones. That's labor intense. I'm a one man show when it comes to bees almost. So it's hard for me to do that, but it, it could be productive. I certainly understand that. Um, there's hard, it's hard for us to know if drone congregations are really around. I have never seen one. 
A lot of people have said they've seen them before. They're usually 60, 80 feet up in the air, but they're hard to see and hard, hard to find out. Do you need to leave a, a newly purchased nuke colony in its nuke box for any period of time, or can you move it right in the 10 frame high? Here's the trick to that. That's a really good question. So one time, way back when I was a new beginner beekeeper, I got a bunch of nukes and uh, brought them home in the back of my pickup truck. And I went to put them in boxes the same time that I drove up and they were not happy. They got shake, shaken up and they were all kind of like traveling, travel weary and they were hot. And then somebody said, oh, you just need to let them rest for a day. So I kind of like the idea of bringing a nucleus home, putting it right near your hive where it's going to go into and then open them up and run <laughs> in case they fly out looking for who shook them up in the back of the truck. But open them up, let them fly a little bit right there where they're going to be going in that big hive. And then, you know, you can do that just before night or, you know, just let them kind of take a potty break. Next day, go out there, you know, mid-morning or something, transfer them over. That's probably a good way to avoid them being mad at you for traveling. David, third year beekeeper here. Can you explain how to use a beeline box? Uh, I would like to experiment with that. Um, I'm going to talk about that. I'll be right back. Hang on. I actually uh, actually had one sent to me. Look at this. Um, I'm going to make a video about this beeline box. Look at that. Um, it's amazing. This beeline box. I'm, I'm wetting all of your appetites, aren't I? Look at that. That's great. A very kind YouTube commenter, YouTube uh, subscriber sent me this. So I'm going to make a whole video, maybe even on live stream, talk about this. But in a nutshell, what is beelining? Been around for a long time. Books written about it. Uh, Tom Seeley, uh, Dr. Tom Seeley from Cornell. He has presented on beelining. He's done it a lot. And he has a lot of good uh, conference uh, presentations where he talks about beelining. Essentially... It's like, you, I'll, I'll give you the simple version. You go out there with a little bowl of sugar water and a bee lands on it, right? You don't have any hives. You're just out in the woods somewhere. Bee lands, drink some sugar water. Now the bee's going to pick up and go somewhere. Let's say the bee goes that way. Watch the bee as far as you can. Walk that way. Stand there with your bowl till she comes back. And so you kind of just keep following how she's going until, aha, you arrive at the beehive. Isn't that cool? You're beelining, you're tracking down where they're taking that sugar water back. And then once you find out where they're at, you'll say, there they are. They're 120 feet up in that pine tree. <laughs> what can you do, right? No, it is a fun activity. Even if you don't want to take it, you have spent some time. It's like geocaching. Any of you ever done geocaching? But it's kind of like that. You're just tra tracing down where these hives are coming from. And it's beelining. But I am going to make a video, talk more about that. That's that's some pretty cool subjects. Hey, we want to make a we want to have a giveaway now. Actually, we're going to give away one of our biggest online courses. So you can wait until the 18th and get them half price, but somebody's going to win the ultimate beekeeping course tonight. And the what I want you to do is leave a comment, hashtag the number seven, just hashtag seven, because there's seven courses in our ultimate uh, online course. So this is an online beekeeping course that includes all of my seven courses that I have available. So leave hashtag seven is how you can win this um, online beekeeping course tonight. That's going to be fun. Let me start collecting some comments here. Hashtag seven. Okay. About 70 of you have hit hashtag seven. Now, let me say, if you're watching this video, not live, like you're watching it on Friday, you're not here live on Saturday night. If you're watching it after the live stream, you can't win. There's no reason to, to put hashtag seven if you're not watching this live. <laughs> so there's no reason to do that. Got 130 uh, people trying uh, to win the ultimate beekeeping course. It's fun. Uh, it really is. I, I tell you what, I loved making these online courses. It took a lot of work, took a lot of time, but they will be 50% off starting in a couple of days. If you don't win, go to your spouse, 
go to your buddy and say, gosh, I didn't win it, but I really want these. And uh, maybe they'll say, just buy it this weekend. <laughs> it's great. Number seven, you, hashtag number seven, online beekeeping courses. Um, now, listen, if you already have the ultimate course, there's no reason to try for it again. You're just uh, cutting somebody else out that already that hasn't won it yet. So don't do that. <laughs> you can't do anything with two of them. Right. And uh, these are for your private viewing only. And once you win, you can email us at longlanehoneybees at gmail.com and uh, let them know your email address. And Sherry, my staff, will make sure that you get your online beekeeping course. All right. I'm up to uh, about 175. Hashtag seven. Going to leave it open just uh, 30 more seconds. If you want to win, comment with, Hashtag number seven, you can win. So again, this ties right into what I'm saying. Uh, hey, Richard, thanks for that $20 donation, by the way. Winter Be Kind has my fall. Ooh, I lost your comment. It got swallowed up in the number sevens. Uh, okay. Winter Be Kind has my fall two-in-one combined sugar, uh, combined super hive busting at the seams and wanting to swarm. Still too cold for a week to dive in and split. How do I slow them down? Swarm traps are out, but Richard, yeah, I know that. Uh, thank you, by the way, for the $20. By the way, Richard, it is awesome. You know, like people tell me, David, why would you feed bees in the winter time like that? You're going to have too many. They're going to swarm on you. Well, if I don't, I'm going to either lose them because they're going to freeze to death, starve to death, or I'm going to come out of winter with a tiny little hive of 10,000 bees. I like the problem of having a lot of bees. This isn't, I know this isn't the best thing to say, but I'm going to say it. Even if my bees swarm and I lose half of them, I still come out of winter with more hives or more bees than if I hadn't have fed them. Like if I come out of winter with 60,000 bees, I'm coming out with 30,000, even if half of them swarm. In the old days, I only came out of winter with 10,000. So, but anyway, try to control swarms. Richard, here's a trick, a little trick. If you're worried about swarms and you need a little bit more time, you can throw a queen excluder between the bottom board and the bottom deep box. The queen can't go through that. And if they try to swarm, mama's not going with them. Don't leave that on there forever because drones aren't going through it. It's going to clog up stuff. But you can buy it maybe a week time, week to 10 days if you're desperate. All right, let's go ahead and do a little drawing. Let's see. I need to get that screen over here. Give me a second. Uh, what is that called? Share screen giveaway. Share that screen over here. All right. Uh, how do I make that screen a little bigger? It's kind of small. Maybe I'll take my face out. Again, if you guys uh, didn't win, they're all, they are going to be on sale uh, this weekend. So keep track of that uh, coming up starting on the 18th as well. So that'd be real important to get involved in those uh, online courses. So that even though you're one to five year old beekeeper, there's still a lot to learn, isn't it? I'm learning things all the time. And every day I'm learning something new about beekeeping. So no matter where you're at in your beekeeping career, I know all of us continue to learn as we go. It's real important. So uh, let me just kind of summarize tonight. If you are thinking about uh, your beekeeping endeavors starting up and a lot of your new beekeepers, be pumped up and excited. It's okay to make mistakes. That's how we all learn. If you're a one or two or five year beekeeper and you're still trying to figure it out, hey, that's okay. What, how else are you going to figure it out unless you go out there and try it? Another secret weapon that I talk about a lot is one of the things you can do to learn faster is to get a five frame nuke box. And in that five frame nuke, let that run all season with only five frames in it. Let them raise a queen or something. Let that be your learning box. You don't have 30 frames, two deeps and a super to fight with. 
You're going to learn and watch out of a five frame nuke box all year long. Yeah, they're going to want to swarm. They're going to build up. You can transfer some frames out, put them in a hive or something, but keep giving them foundation to pull out. You can manage that. But even if they swarm, you know, it's not all that bad. You get to witness a swarm or something. But uh, think about that. It's really a cool thing. When I was out in Nevada, I taught about this, that one of the ways we can level up our beekeeping experience is by learning out of a smaller five frame nucleus box of bees. And we can learn how to handle frames. We're not as intimidated. The, the, the hive is not as large, not as many bees. They're more manageable. Usually they're more calmer and we can get into them as often as we want to learn things, to experiment. So those five frame nucleuses are really a fun way to learn. And especially those of you that are starting with family members. I know a lot of you are starting with your granddaughters, your, your daughters or your sons or something. you got your family involved in beekeeping. But if you can set aside a little five frame nucleus for even the young, youngsters to get involved with, boy, that can help tremendously as well. Big help. Okay, uh, one of the things I wanted to share tonight, I told you I was going to talk about this. And someone, uh, I remember, made a donation. Uh, several of you have made donations to help me buy a flow hive. That is so generous of you. Here's the deal with that. I'm going to be running several new colon or several new hives in 2023 for video purposes. It's going to be kind of an expansion of my video format. I'm going to be running out of a, a large um, horizontal hive. I'm looking forward to that, hoping to get that at the end of um, April. And then I, I actually, um, actual, actual, um, let me get this straight. I want to say these things correctly. I don't want to overspeak or anything, but um, the uh, flow hive, I've been talking with them. And so it's funny because I really emailed them to find out how it's the fastest way I can get a flow hive. That was important to me because I don't want to get it in the middle of July, right? So I sent them an email. I said, I want to get a flow hive. Thank you, Munchie, for that $20 donation super sticker. That is so nice of you. I appreciate it. So when I contacted the flow hive people and said, I'm interested in a flow hive, but I don't know whether I should buy it off Amazon because I can get it quicker than if I buy it off your website. Does it come from Australia? I don't know. You know what? That Get this. Very kind of them. They wrote me back and said, We'll exchange a free flow hive for you making content about it on your YouTube channel. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I know you're happy about that. I can't do that. No, I, I said that's very generous of you. Thank you, flow hive company. And I get that. And it's fine if some content creators do that. It's 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 okay because you're you're talking about a product, you should get paid for that for doing that. But for me personally, I don't want to do that. I, I have the money to buy it, and I'm going to buy it with my own money. I'm going to buy the flow high with my own money. <laughs> Thanks, Marianne. That $10, yeah, it's going to help me pay for my flow hive. But I kind of think that if I buy my own flow hive, I can say what I want to about it, right? I don't, not that I wouldn't, but you know, if somebody gives you something, it's hard to you know, say what you don't like about it, maybe, because, yeah, they gave it to me for free. They want me to promote it, but me buying it with my own money. And what's funny is a lot of people, let's see, when is the best time to make a double deep brood split right before the flow, several weeks prior, providing queens are available for purchase? Yeah, I would probably make a split. Uh, it's always best to make your splits right around the time, about a week before they swarm naturally. So for me, I like to make my splits the end of April because my bees are going to start swarming in the first of uh, May. So I like to be able to evaluate uh, and review products by paying cash, my own money for it. Here's the deal. A lot of people do reviews because they, they donated the, to the content creator. And then the content creator, not just beekeeping, everybody. It's funny because they'll say, this had, this is good because it has that, it has this, it has that, but I need to find something negative to say about it. So it does have a few cons. One of them is it doesn't come in yellow. Oh, come on. Really? That's all you got? They, they softballing it, you know? Man, if I get a flow hive, something's wrong with it, and it doesn't work right for me. I paid for it. I have, I have every right to say this doesn't work right. 
Or if it's wonderful, I don't feel bad saying I paid for it with my own money and this thing is this thing rocks. I don't know. It's just that's just me though. I, I'm not saying everybody should be like me. I just feel better about that. Uh, okay. I uh, have brought out a poly equivalent called the B box. Oh yeah, I'll say, okay. So B box smart system. So you're saying that there's another company that has a similar product uh, than the at, that the Flow Hive has. By the way, the Flow Hive, the the actual oh I can't remember the date anymore. The actual Flow Hive uh, concept where you turn a crank and frame separate and honey comes out, had a patent on it way back. I don't know. Was it 1930, 1940? It was way back. It had a patent on it. But the patent ran out. And it was made a little differently. It was made out of, uh, I think, metal, maybe. And so it wasn't a brand new concept, by the way, when it just came out recently. It had been a concept from way back. I ran a top. Oh, a Top bar hive and a horizontal last year, first year was tough, but I'm excited this year. I've ran top bar hives. Yes, I've ran top bar hives. I haven't ran the big horizontal hives, the big square ones, you know. I had a I had a flow super. Oh yeah, just a super, right? Greg, Greg now. I lost the comment. Greg now uses it. Was that castle hives that said that? Here it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, Greg now uses it at his learning yard to show folks how it works. OK, uh, cool. Uh, Flow Hive. So you can just buy the super and put it on top of uh, of your Langstroth boxes. So that's good. I appreciate that, Brian. Yeah. And um, I like I'm wanting to do it because I think it'll help me understand how all these things work. People ask me what I think about them. I can honestly tell them I ran it. This is what I think. Yeah, uh, Gene, integrity is important to me, um, indeed. Now, let me get this straight, though. I, I'm i not opposed to somebody sponsoring my channel. Like somebody says, hey, you work hard for these videos, David. If you have this product, then we'll pay you and help support your channel. I'm not saying I'll never do that. I have got a ton of proposals. But let me tell you, some of these proposals are thousands of dollars. They really are. And the products are worth three to five thousand dollars. People are giving me uh, proposals every. You know, you get a hundred thousand subscribers. They give. They want their. They want their product on your page. But here's my deal. Here's the dealio with that. Um, they don't fit with you guys. You're 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 the reason I make videos. And so I'm not going to endorse or have a sponsorship. Kind of drag my videos down, trying to sell an anti-snoozing nose mount or an electric bicycle, or a mattress that does miracles. You know what I mean? I just can't bring myself to, I, I'm not that hard up for money yet. <laughs> if I get really broke, you guys are going to have to put up with anti-snoring nose mounts, and you're going to have to put up with mattress ads. <laughs> but boy, if you keep donating like you did tonight, uh, I appreciate that. That gives me some flexibility to turn away these sponsorships and uh, focus on the value that you're getting out of my videos. Because sometimes I watch videos and all the ones there's an interruption of this long drawn out sponsorship. And I kind of don't like that. I have used styrofoam beehives before. And uh, funny thing about that, I was, I'm always used to putting my smoker on top of the top cover <laughs> and I'm working a, a hive there. Thank you, Stacy, for the $10. Appreciate it. You are sponsoring this video. <laughs> Not really, but you are. And I set my smoker on top of the styrofoam top cover and it was hot and it just started just melting in. I was like, oh, so I was worried about styrofoam getting kind of beat up by tree branches and smokers. Thanks for this free swarm queen excluder tip. But what about the upper entrance on the winter bee kind board? Can my queen escape to swarm from out of the top entrance? And that's a good question. I can't speak to that. I do have a pretty good mind, though, that can calculate all this really quickly on biology. It doesn't feel like they would because it's so small and usually it would be difficult to run all the bees and the queen out of that tiny little spot. Is it possible? Absolutely. Is it likely? Probably not. 
But that's the difficult in transitioning, Richard, from the winter bee kind in the winter to feeding them like the Burns feeding system. Now they have to learn their bottom entrance. It's going to take a week, going to take a while. Funny thing, though, when you transition from the top winter bee kind entrance to the bottom board entrance, go out there at night after dark, they figured it out. They all went in the bottom. But then in the daytime, they won't back in that hole that's not there. If you're really concerned about it, tape it up. Make them run out of the bottom. And that way they have to go through your queen excluder that we talked about. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. It is 8 o'clock. I have had a hoot. I have had a ball today. You guys are the best. Oh, my gosh. What type of bee do you think is best for beginners? I got the perfect bee that's right for the beginner. You know what I'm going to say? Apis mellifera. Yeah, just the honeybee. Uh, doesn't matter to me if it's a if it's a, has some heritage from Italy, some heritage from you know wherever. Doesn't matter. Just make sure it's from a good, reliable source, good reputation, because Apis mellifera is Apis mellifera. Genetics sometimes uh, do play a big part. Probably not for a beginner. Don't forget, guys, online courses. This uh, just couple days. We really appreciate your support. If you buy those online courses, uh, just check out those online courses at honeybeesonline.com. And that will really help us out and help you out. And that's what the world is all about. All of us helping each other out. It's so huge. So again, I want to thank you guys for showing up tonight being a part of my live stream and I am going to check out and say good night to all of you. I love you. You mean a lot to me. You keep me going. So thanks for your support. See you guys. Mm -hmm.